What I'm going to talk about here is, again, back to the density management studies. There have been uh, several components. We spoke earlier to the microclimate responses. Um, concurrent with the sampling of, of those conditions, we also were evaluating uh, downed wood characteristics associated with the various treatments. And what I'm going to speak to today is actually a combination of work that uh, I was involved with, and I'm also bringing in some work that uh, Dee Dee Olson has been involved with, as well as Adrian Aries. So when we look across the density management study sites, we find a lot of characteristics or a lot of situations uh, that vary quite a bit in terms of downed wood and those kinds of features. And I think one of the things that really kind of highlights one of the concerns about uh, the forest structure that has arisen in a lot of our landscape is illustrated by this picture up here, which shows a, a fairly dense, uh, well-established young stand. And if you look at this, the forest floor, there's not a whole lot going on here. We don't see much downed wood. We don't see much regeneration. And actually, in this photo, you see that they actually did a trial of underplanting, and of course, in that dense of canopy, we didn't get any underplant or successful uh, establishment. But then when we look across these sites, there's quite a bit of variability out there. And at some sites, we can actually find uh, a good evidence of some legacy wood features that provide certain habitat values. And this is just illustrated in a couple of photos here. Uh, some examples of embedded within some of these stands that were treated in the density management studies, there was actually uh, some existing downed wood that would provide some uh, good habitat features. In many cases, uh, some of the leave islands that we described in the outline of the study might have been uh, uh, anchored on features, legacy features that were still present at some of these sites. But from the context of the riparian buffers, uh, basically, we see uh, quite a bit of variability there as well. And these uh, images kind of illustrate that we have a combination of things going on. We have a combination of legacy wood. You can see some of this larger material, moss covered or whatever. And we have some of this more recent downed wood. And we'll be speaking to that in our presentation in terms of what uh, I think I called hard and soft, or, or decay classes one and two versus decay classes three and four. So again, gets back to the question of how wide should buffers be. Another diagram from FEMAT uh, kind of brings into uh, conceptualization coarse wood uh, inputs to stream, as well as perhaps uh, you know, things like snags along streams and what they contribute in terms of wood strength and, or root strength. Uh, but basically, again, the question is how far or how effective uh, in terms of distance from channel is that as a source of coarse wood for stream input? Again, I'm just going to click through this really quick. We have the same riparian buffers that I spoke to earlier. We have the same uh, generalized layout. But what I'd like to illustrate here is in our first phase of density management study, uh, one of our uh, studies was based on those transects. Those same transects that we spoke to in terms of microclimate are illustrated here. But also ongoing within density management has been monitoring of downed wood where the uh, focal uh, unit of study has actually been the stream reach. Uh, at that point, it's not working at this point. Um, and so a reach-based assessment. And Dee Dee Olson has been monitoring this reach-based assessment of downed wood for many years uh, in the study. More recently, um, in phase two, uh, I've gone to doing a different sampling design where we're actually uh, monitoring based on small basins within the design or within the study. But first, I'll just kind of speak to what we found in our first uh, foray into this in the early phase of density management based on the transects. Uh, so basically, in terms to try and encapsulate what we found through five years of, of post-treatment monitoring at the end of five years, actually what this shows is both pre and post. Um, here we have downward cover as a, where the metric is percent cover. Along this axis, we have 
buffer or upslope, and P0 refers to pretreatment. Uh, P2 ref, uh, refers to a second post-treatment assessment three to five years following uh, the thinning activity. And what we see from these uh, different diagrams is if we look at the upper diagram, which illustrates what I call sort of the smaller coarse wood, this is actually coarse wood where the piece sizes are five to 30 centimeters in diameter. We really see that both pre-treatment and post-treatment, there's not a lot of separation among treatments except for this one stream side retention treatment with a very narrow buffer. And basically pre-treatment to post-treatment, what we're seeing is a decrease in the range of variability among those mean uh, treatment responses. And so we kind of view that as more of a homogenization of the variability among sites and among reaches, among treatments. And we see that same kind of response down here when we look at the larger coarse wood, those pieces that are 30 centimeters in diameter or greater. And basically what we're seeing here again is where we have some elevation is where we have narrow buffers adjacent, or uh, relatively narrow buffers either adjacent to a patch opening or just a very narrow buffer where we have higher levels prior to treatment. So again, we see this treatment uh, elevated level, but it's a pre-treatment condition. So this is kind of points out the, the value of having pre and post treatment uh, data relative to um, just doing a retrospective assessment. But what we see here, we still in terms of the dynamics, the change in time, what we see is between pre-treatment and post-treatment, we get sort of a narrowing of this range of means. So things tend to start to homogenize even in the bigger uh, material. When we look at simply a comparison of of post-treatment responses uh, in the upslope, basically we're just seeing very, very little change in the distribution of either this smaller version of coarse wood or this larger version of coarse wood. Uh, so basically, the biggest changes were associated with either narrow streamside retention buffers um, and relative to pretreatment amounts, basically the distribution in amounts became less variable among and within sites. So downward dynamics after thinning, so this gets at rate of uh, accrual or a change in the amount of downward cover. And what we're seeing in these diagrams, again, we have the same kind of axes of the same kind of treatment, oops, sorry, same treatment designations going from uh, control through our more narrow buffers. But in terms of uh, accrual rates, basically the Differences are occurring within minus one to one percent per year. Really, in the buffer, we're not seeing much differences, many differences or, uh, at all from, from a zero or a static condition. When we look in the upslope, uh, we're seeing that we're actually having a, a reduction in the amount over time, about a one percent change per year in the amount of this smaller version of coarse wood. And that may be due to, uh, in these uh, uh, openings and whatnot, you're starting to get a breakdown of, of slash material that was present. So this is the change from the immediate post-treatment to uh, three to five years later. When we look at the big wood, um, we see some indication, perhaps a slight change in the mounts coming into the buffer but the variability about any of the treatment means is so great that we're really not seeing much separation in terms of, of recruitment rates in the buffer. In the upslope, uh, those, those uh, recruitment rates uh, are really all over the board in terms of, and it's really hard to, to look at that and see anything that you can infer as a pattern in response to the treatment. So basically what we're seeing in the downwood story at these local scales is a fairly dynamic condition with a lot of variability. So if we were to summarize that, we would kind of conclude that you know, base thinning led to you know, very subtle changes in the downwood cover. In the treated upland, these responses tended to be most prevalent in patch openings. Within the buffers, responses are most prevalent for narrow buffers, particularly when adjacent to patch openings. And then small downwood be became 
more homogenous across reaches. Um, one of the concerns that we have about interpreting this came up with the last question or the question behind uh, Jeremy's talk is, you know, in terms of truly useful assessments, we require some sort of better knowledge about what the ecological relevance of these changes are with respect to changes in downwood. And uh, I just give the citation here for the paper by Anderson and Melison where we describe these findings. I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking about the channel-based assessment of riparian downwood. So this is the work that D.D. Olson has been doing for a long time. And so it's a little different frame of reference, and it really kind of gets at downwood, what's the sources of downwood that are contributing directly to channel uh, downwood, channel streamwood, uh, which has a lot of implications for uh, stream structure and habitat. So recently, Adrian Aries completed an analysis of some of the work, the data that uh, Didi has collected over the years. And basically, what I'm describing here in just a brief couple of summary slides are an analysis that, co oops, sorry, that covers uh, data collected at three of the sites and really looks at and examines uh, downwood associated with two of the different buffers, either this variable width or the streamside retention buffer. So this uh, analysis was summarized as a panel of graphs here, which illustrate uh, pr the temporal dynamics. So we're looking at going from pre-treatment through one, two, five, and nine years post-harvest. And we're looking at different decay classes and the volume of downwood that exists per 100 meters of reach length. And so what you see here in this diagram is this trend for uh, slight increases in the amount of very, uh, downed wood volume associated with variable uh, width buffers versus some fairly large uh, substantial increases in the amount of downwood associated with streamside retention buffers. It's interesting to note, however, that uh, some of this, the temporal dynamics, they occur pretty early on with the streamside retention but we have this interesting trend here also where the control streams also ended up uh, five to nine years out as having a, a fairly large increase in downwood volume. So these are untreated reaches which are also experiencing perhaps some sort of an episodic input of downwood. Um, and that's in the fresh wood, so that's, that's decay classes one and two. If we look at some of this older, more decayed wood, which we might call legacy wood, we see a little bit different pattern where we do have a tendency for some separate uh, increases in uh, the streamside retention buffers. But again, if this is older wood, um, it's, it's, it's interesting to note or to try and distinguish whether those are sort of a snag recruitment, but you look at this higher value to begin with, and again, it's this pretreatment legacy condition that somehow is being reflected in that one treatment. Um, and we saw that also with the data that I had. Um, and so if you look in total, these are the dynamics uh, associated with those, and they don't really separate out well just because of the high variability surrounding any of these mean values. So one of the questions that's uh, become important or was raised uh, by our management partners is, well, what is the source of that downwood? How far is that downwood being recruited from? And so this diagram illustrates an analysis done uh, on sort of this, I believe, is the 10th year data or, uh, from the density management studies. Again, those three sites and the two treatments. But what this axis is, is mean distance from source of wood. So when they did their survey, when they encountered a piece of wood that entered the channel zone, they followed it back to its point of origin and measured that distance outward. And what these graphs show here is each bar represents a reach. The lighter green bars represent data that was collected before the most recent thinning, second thinning entry. The colored bars from Callahan Creek and O.M. Hubbard represent data that was collected uh, in a immediately post-treatment survey. And the things that kind of stand out from that is that if we look across the, the different treatments, we're seeing that the range of distances 
really don't really differ that much amongst these different uh, treatments, the buffer treatments. And what we also see is if you compare the colored bars where they reside within the range of the green bars, pre and post, we're not really seeing much change in the distribution of distances at this point in time. So uh, uh, in a sense, these, these uh, more recent additions are still falling within the, or the range of distribution for source distances that existed prior to that treatment. So initial post-thinning recruitment was greatest for the narrowest type of buffer. The most recent wood recruitment occurred in the floodplain rather than within the wetted or active channel. And then longer term recruitment may be driven by storms or other disturbance events. And so one last uh, set of slides. Uh, our approach has changed as to how we're uh, monitoring uh, downed wood. Um, and so what we're seeing uh, from by looking at a, the full extent from stream channel all the way up to ridge tops within these small basins, these are the kinds of patterns that exist 10 years after uh, the initial thinning treatment. Um, and what we're seeing here is if you look across these axes with distance from bank full, what we're illustrating here with the blue line is the uh, large downwood volume. So again, these are the big pieces of wood. Um, these blue lines represent what we're calling hard or uh, decay classes one and two. The uh, Red lines illustrate the uh, softer uh, downwood or decay classes three through five. And the point here is along these uh, transects uh, or distance from bank full, there's a huge amount of variability. And what we're trying to look for and what we'll be looking for over time is whether there's correlation between the spatial variability and the occurrence of edge features that might arise from either the stream itself or from the position of a buffer, an edge or a buffer edge. And so far, the amount of variability with distance uh, is really kind of swamping uh, some of the, any potential signal at this point in terms of buffer or edge uh, effects. So we'll be monitoring that over time. This, so we got this 10th year data and we'll be collecting the immediate post uh, thinning data uh, coming up in 2012. So there's some real unresolved issues for riparian down wood. And that's really kind of a, a focus of where we're, we're trying to address over the next uh, few years. How much wood is enough? Um, how large should it be? Where is it needed? When is it needed? And what roles can silviculture play in its provision? I just want to point to two things and before I uh, conclude. Um, we really don't have a lot of good reference conditions. This uh, diagram here represents uh, downwood distribution uh, by percent of area, so amount of percent cover of downwood. And this is taken from the decade model. And so it shows in um, for similar types of forests as to where the density management is being uh, conducted, what typical distributions of down wood. So if we were to look at across stands, we might say that you might find 2% or less of downwood cover on 21% of the stands of that forest type. Uh, so if you wanted 4 to 6% of, of cover downwood, that might be represented by as many as it looks like about 60% uh, of the stands. So where are our levels of downed wood in the density management studies relative to typical distribution of downed wood cover? So we have a, a reference tool like Decade that has been linked to, uh, links the percent cover of downed wood to effective use by different species of, of critters. And, as percent cover downwood increases, more species uh, are make use of those types of conditions. Do we have anything like that that would reflect the distribution of downwood, typical distributions of downwood in riparian areas and streams? Um, there was a nice paper done by Fox and Bolton that tend to uh, describe 
typical patterns or typical abundances of downed wood of various metrics, metrics, metrics um, for streams. And this was developed for Western Washington. It doesn't cover Western Oregon. But what we still lack is the link between what typical amounts are present and the degree to which they're satisfying the needs of a number of organisms. And the question of, if you add more, how more functional does a stream become? And I'll leave it with that. I appreciate the value of, of measuring the actual effects of these treatments that you're putting out on the ground, but it, it strikes me that it's kind of similar to judging the performance of your stocks in a highly dynamic market by just looking at a few weeks or a few months worth of ups and downs. And so as you're sampling, capturing, are, is your, are your samples big enough and long enough to capture those episodic events that are going to recruit you know, wood into the streams over time and the, and the growth rate over time, might it be more valuable to actually look at modeling results in a thin condition and an unthin condition to, to answer some of these questions? Yeah, oh, actually, you're absolutely right. So if you look at the history of density management studies, we've been monitoring this stuff depending on some of it, uh, you know, beginning in 1996, 97, and up through now. So. Yes, the, the, the study itself, the empirical data, has a short temporal uh, representation. And there's absolute need to monitor over time because it is these episodic events that are going to be the big, potentially some of the big drivers of what the uh, habitat value is in those streams over time. Um, and in fact, we've got some people on the docket following up to really kind of address some of that. From a modeling perspective, the caveat, I think models are really useful, but models that don't have empirical data behind them are less useful. And I think one of the, the key things that we can do if we are judicious in how we allocate our research dollars and our monitoring dollars is we can try and couple some ground truth data that would actually substantiate what's being shown in a model. And so I think we still have a dearth of information to really back up a lot of the modeling efforts uh, that might be used to project out into the future. And so I think, yeah, modeling is a, it's a, it's a great tool, um, but you have to be awfully careful about how you build policy around a modeled simulation versus a model simulation that has substantive validating data behind it. So one of the roles that we can play is building data sets to help with that question.